The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So let's just take stock a little bit on uh, why we're going to do this next module. Uh, did you guys have some troubles with the supply chain management in your factories on this last round of simulation? We did. We did. And how about the suppliers down there? Did you uh, have a lot of visibility? What was going on with your customers? For all I know, they're building houses. They're building houses. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not very well. And we heard yesterday from Jeff at, uh, at Gorton's about how critical his supply chain was in his transformation of Gorton's to a lean enterprise. And we heard also a little bit of aspect medical about supply chain. So supply chain is a, is a really critical area of, uh, of a lean transformation. And uh, here's just a quote that 7% of the companies today are effectively managing their supply chain. Now that's a little bit out of date. It's 2003, but only 7%. But they're 73% more profitable than the other manufacturers. So who are some of the companies you think about, you might think about that have a are well known for good supply chain management. Dell, Dell. Walmart, UPS, Toyota. Okay, exactly. Okay, so here's our objectives for this module. Uh, at the end of this module, you'll be able to recognize the importance of suppliers in the enterprise. I think you probably know that going into the module. We're going to talk about the four key attributes of a lean supply chain. One of them is aligning the design, the product design, or whatever your 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 area is with the supply chain. There needs to be an alignment there. One is having the suppliers participate in your material flow. You know, I saw someone from the supplier table coming up here delivering parts. That's participation in the material flow. Having them actually involved in the design and development of your, of your product. And then the information flow. And so then we're also, most organizations have a legacy supply chain that they have to transform. Uh, Aspect Medical was kind of lucky it was a startup, but we heard from Jeff, for example, a company's been in, Jeff, 1889? 1849. 1849, okay, they had a legacy supply chain they had to deal with. This picture sort of diagrammatically shows how suppliers interact with both the product development and production. So remember the customer is the one that specifies the value, and then the, the role of product development or engineering, which Annalise is going to talk about this afternoon, is really to develop a design which, when produced, meets those customer expectations. Okay? And one of the things that happens in a lean supply chain is to get those suppliers involved early. Not think of them as something you add on at the end of your design, but to get them working with you during the design. And in the aerospace area, typically 60 to 80 percent of the product value, that is the, the dollar value of the product, is outsourced to the suppliers. And now we saw that yesterday at Aspect Medical. They didn't give us the numbers, I don't believe. But they don't make anything. They assemble things. Okay? Uh, John Coolidge said that they, they're a final assembler. So a lot of the value of that product they buy from suppliers. So suppliers are absolutely critical to their success. Then when it gets to production, and Annalise is going to talk more about the interaction of product development and production, where the value is created and delivered back to the customers, you want to have your suppliers as partners. Okay, so you have to think of the suppliers as part of your enterprise, and we call that the extended enterprise. Okay? So today you want to think about those guys at the back table as part of your enterprise. They're not somebody you just send orders to and get parts from. Okay, now what does the supply chain look like? Well, here's a, a sort of generic picture, starting with the end user, customer, the prime all the way down to some raw material supplier. And usually these are in tiers, first tier, second tier, and third tier uh, suppliers. And as you move down the supply chain, you know, each tier represents a smaller proportion of the main business, but they're very critical. So let's just get a little example. We have an interesting group here, a very diverse group. So let me call in some people and tell us a little bit about where you fit in your supply chain and, and how far up and down you can see. So Tam, you're, you're with Intel, okay. Where, where, is your, where in Intel do you fit in this? Uh, are you a prime or are you a supplier to a prime? Or? Uh, not really sure. <laughs> I work uh, in product development. Okay. Company, so I would say I, I'm the 
the facility that's prior to the main part of the Okay. So, okay, so a, a couple things here. First of all, Tam is in product development and he doesn't know what his supply chain is, right? Okay, is that, is that kind of what I hear? You don't, who's your end customer, do you know? For something? Okay, so, so your, that's not the end customer, but your, you have a manufacturing, that's your customer is the, is the manufacturing facility. And what are they making? Our product. Our Okay, and are they th then selling that to uh, Hewlett Packard or somebody, or? Yeah, people are putting orders in, they go to our manufacturers. Okay, okay. And th so they go to some customer from Intel, and then eventually some end user like Donna? Lynn. Sorry, Lynn. It's, you know, she's using her computer, she's the end user. Okay, okay, so uh, let's pick a different, Luis. Luis, you were the U.S. Air Force, okay. Now, where are you in this in this uh, supply chain here? Well, um, we're a developer, uh, so we would we would be uh, a customer. You'd be a customer, okay? And who might be the end user of what you develop? Uh, the space wing, the forty fifth space wing. The space space wing. Forty fifth space wing. <coughs> okay, space wing. Okay, and uh, sitting where you sit as a customer, how far down the supply chain do you interact with people? Not very far down because we have a, a contractor uh, that does all that. Okay, so, so and, uh, your contractors like Lockheed or Northrop Grumman? Okay, so you interact with a contractor who interacts with the suppliers. Okay. Now, Carlos, you're with Cargill? Yes. Okay, and uh, in Mexico, right? Yes. Okay, so you're, uh, uh, do you food products or? Okay, so where would you be in this, in this supply chain? Prime okay, so you're the prime, and who might be your customers? Uh, distributors. Okay, and then uh, how far down the supply chain do you? To the last. The last you see all the way down the supply yes, chain. Cool. Okay. Okay, I'd like to call one more group here, and I don't know much about it all. Someone from the Veterans Administration. So, Doug. I don't, you know, yeah, you're working with healthcare and stuff. Yeah, like so that. I'm basically at the end user. Okay. Uh, but I work in the laboratory. Oh, okay. So I'm actually a customer, and I provide results to the clinicians, and I interact with the kind manufacturer that gives us our patients to use that results. Okay. Cool. Okay. So that you can see that th these are uh, just different examples of supply chain. Now, one of the things that comes out a little bit in this little exercise we did, but is, is really a very true thing, is that most people in a, in a non-lean supply chain don't have much visibility up or downstream in that supply chain. And so what they get is what we call, they get the orders over the wall. You know, so you, know, you, might, you might give an order for reagents and they don't even know it's gonna come until all of a sudden it arrives if it's a non-lean supply chain. Okay, and so there's lack of visibility if you're in the supply chain, there's not much visibility upstream or downstream what's happening until all of a sudden you get something, a request, and you have to react to it. And that's kind of what you have at the back of the table there. You don't have much visibility what's happening up here. Okay. And so that means you're, you're in a very response mode. Okay. So now let's do a little exercise. Um, here are some some attributes of, of supply chains. And what we want you to do is gather around your easel charts and uh, discuss these a little bit and write down what are these, which of these attributes do you uh, identify with what you might think is a lean supply chain, realizing we haven't really covered that topic yet, but this is part of how we're gonna go about it. And talk a little bit about what you think might be the, the top three priorities uh, for a lean supply chain. So let's just say, for example, you picked all these as representing a lean supply chain and not those. Which of these th are the three most important you think to have a lean supply chain? So let's spend about uh, 10 minutes doing that uh, around your easel charts, and then we're going to see uh, what we collectively come up with a lean supply chain. Okay? Can we invite our yeah, you can invite your suppliers if you'd like, sure. <laughs> that sounds like a good practice. <laughs> okay. So let's, uh, let's see, let me call on the table up here. Uh, 
table in the northeast corner, okay, northwest corner of the building. What are your top uh, characteristics of a lean supply chain and why did you pick them? Someone want to give us that briefing? Well, collaboration. Um, the first one we picked was responsive and agile. Um, and the second one was responsive and agile. We need our supplier to give us what we need, when we need it, and the time we need it so that we can make our, make our quota. Um, enterprise approach, so the end to end, so just knowing like what the other processes need, we don't end up with an extra wing when we don't really need it. Um, and then we had a tie with collaboration and continuous improvement activities with supplier and customers. So again, just kind of partnering with our suppliers and not just being separate entities. Good, okay. Good choices. Good choices, good priorities. How about back here? We did collaboration and supplier commitment to long-term relationships, which probably go together. Because if you're going to have a long-term relationship, you're going to sort of work together. Good rationale. Visibility of demand, so you can see what's coming, and just continually improve. Continuous improvement. OK, Continuous improvement. good. And you had some others up there that you put lower priority. I mean, the enterprise approach makes sense of looking at the whole yeah. envelope and build to order so that your, driven, your activities are driven by the customer requests. Responsive. Okay, good. Um, okay, uh, let's take one more, and then uh, how about up here with uh, all the colored dots? It looks to me like you did the uh, multi-voting. That's good. <laughs> Someone want to tell us about that? Uh, yeah, we we saved the discussion and just voted, um, and we came to the view that uh, continuous, continuous improvement is uh, a good thing for a lead supply chain. Um, Together with collaboration and uh, the holistic enterprise approach. Okay, so we're seeing some commonality here. Uh, let's see, let me just look at the others. I see kind of the same things on the remaining ones here. Okay, so I think you guys got pretty much uh, very good. You, you know, you're already beginning to identify what a lean supply chain is before you even have heard about it, so to speak which is part of the purpose of this exercise. Another thing we see is the priorities are a little bit different between tables. And this reflects you know, what happens in the real world is that different uh, organizations might have different priorities as to what they think is most important at a particular time with their supply chain. You know, for whatever reason, you picked it at your table, but you know, maybe they're having difficulty with collaboration or something, so collaboration is going to be more important right now in getting their supply chain lean than, than something else. Uh, the only thing I would add that the build to order, uh, I understand why you put it there as a response to the customer, but that's actually kind of a, a way of describing a non-lean supply chain where you ship orders and they send you back materials, but you don't really engage them at all in the design of the, of the product. You, know, you just send them an order and they send it back, kind of send me the blueprint, send me back the parts and let's negotiate on price type of thing. So the ones that... Uh, are identified here as, as kind of a lean supply chain or collaboration. You got that. Responsive and agile. Uh, you got that. Uh, based on product characteristics. I don't think we had anybody come up on that, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. Inter enterprise approach. Uh, commitment to long-term relationship. Uh, visibility of demand, which was you know, gained over that brick wall barrier, and the continuous improvement. So we're on the same page. Okay, so let's move on now to the second main learning objective. So you can now recognize the attributes of a lean supply chain. Uh, here are the, uh, I mean, the main attributes. Here are the four we're going to talk about. And the first one is uh, alignment with the product characteristics. And this may be a little bit theoretical, but you can think it kind of it in theory of two ends of the extremes. One is you have a push system where somebody builds parts and sends them to you, uh, you know, just, they just kind of, they look upon, they, they build their parts thinking about some demand that might be out there and then they're ready to send them, uh, you know, when somebody makes an order. And the other extreme would be a pull supply chain where they don't build anything until you ask them for that in some, in some way, respond to the customer demand. And, uh, you know, in some sense, supply chains are a combination of push and pull. These are theoretical concepts at the end of a spectrum. Uh, but a push supply chain uh, is, might be uh, most prevalent in a kind of a commodity area where you're uh, maybe still in the economies of scale mentality. Let's build as many as we can and, and ship 
to the demand that comes. In a, in a kind of a mature environment, that probably works pretty well. Okay, so um, paper clips. You know, we're going to use some paper clips tomorrow. One of the exercises. People making paper clips. You know, they kind of know about what the demand is going to be. It doesn't change that rapidly, so they can maybe do a push supply chain type thing. Where a pull supply chain, if you have some specialized part at the other extreme that uh, we're going to show you in a little bit a, an example from Lockheed Martin where they one ship set a year of tubes for an Atlas V rocket. Okay, They don't want to make those tubes until they know that the rocket's about ready to be, to be, to be sent. So the point is that your product may be made up of different components and the supply chains that go with those may be managed somewhat differently. Okay, One size doesn't fit all. So that's what it means to align your product, your supply chain with the product characteristics. Okay, supplier participation material flow and logistics. Um, Just-in-time deliveries, I think everybody's pretty much familiar with that, that that's, that's really a, an, an output of the Toyota production system and all. And of course, the crucial thing is that the parts have to show up when needed because just-in-time parts go right to the assembly line. And so if they don't show up when needed, uh, then everything else gets impacted. On their hand, the advantage is there's no inventory, um, and, uh, and if there are any issues that come up on quality type things, you can correct them right away. Okay, so just-in-time deliveries. Kitting for point of use. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, we talked about that a little bit yesterday, and uh, let's, let's put that off because the next example shows that. Vendor managed inventory. This is where the inventory, instead of being owned by the customer, is taken care of by uh, the vendor. Let me give you an example of that. Um, so JDAM is a joint, def joint uh, direct attack munition. We'll have a picture of it coming up later. It's made in East St. Louis, and one of the parts for that is uh, made in California. I think it's a tail cone or something. And when I went through this plant in East St. Louis, Missouri, there's a video camera on the ceiling uh, in the loading dock where they receive parts. It's like, what's that video camera for? Well, the, the supplier in California is looking at what the inventory is there in East St. Louis and seeing when it's time for them to ship more. So they're managing the inventory of that, of that product, okay? And third-party logistics, this is instead of that organization shipping or the receiving organization shipping, they, they delegate that to FedEx. And FedEx, they hire FedEx to handle all the shipping. And so UPS and FedEx, and those big companies like Atlas Air, we, where's, do you guys do that? Um, we have uh, one of our polar airlines. Polar airlines, yeah, okay. So there's a big business in, uh, in these third party uh, shipping of logistics, you know, third party logistics, okay. So let's look at an example now, and think about these on this next example, and how many of them do we see? Okay, so this is the Atlas V. The Atlas V is a large launch vehicle. It's the, one of the, the Atlas V and the Delta IV are the largest launch vehicles. These are big rockets, okay? And they receive tubes when they have to put together uh, a rocket and a set of what they call a ship set. They call that a ship set. Uh, and a ship set of tubes costs $180,000, okay? And now how do they come? Well, they, in the old way, you know, they came as separate parts. A ship set has 199 parts in it. And they came all in their own packing boxes separately, wrapped up in foam and stuff, and you got all this waste and lots of stuff coming in. That's the old way. The new way is they come in this kit, okay? And everything, all 199 parts uh, with these five major tubes, they have the connectors and all, come as a kit. And they not only come with the the hardware, but the, the tools to assemble them, and usually the instructions that go with it are right, right with that. So we talked, there was some muddy cards yesterday about kitting. This is what kitting is about, okay? And, uh, and, and these aren't, th these, uh, now this is, they make about one or two of these rockets a year, or a, f a small number. So they keep their suppliers informed when they're gonna need that, and uh, all this is managed as one, so, so they don't ship these until this is a pull system. They don't ship it until uh, they know that they're going to need it because it's an expensive thing to have in inventory. And um, uh, all this, 199 parts, is one record in their uh, MRP system. 
they're, okay, instead of 199 different parts they're checking, following, they follow one, okay? So the great reduction in, in costs, uh, handling costs, and, sh and carrying costs, and cycle time. So some of those things we saw on the previous slide, kitting, ven vendor managed inventory, uh, pull system you see in, in situations like this. Okay, let's now turn to supplier involvement in design and development. And oh, by the way, this is a little bit of a segue slide because this is this JDAM munition I mentioned before. And the JDAM part is, it's a retrofitting, retrofitted tail cone on a otherwise dumb bomb. And it turns into a smart bomb. It has a receiver in it and GPS system and so on. Uh, and, and all this, by the way, comes in a kit. Here's what it looks like, okay. Uh, so that's a kidding. But more importantly here, um, when the JDAM was developed, it was done very uniquely. The, this is an Air Force uh, procurement. And when they formed the proposal team to bid on it, a competitive proposal team, they had McDonnell Douglas at that time and Lockheed bidding, they, that proposal team actually had the key suppliers on it. And it also had the Air Force, an Air Force representative on the proposal team. They're, they're proposing to the Air Force, but there was an Air Force representative on it. The Air Force representative was not on for business reasons. The Air Force representative was on so that the designers understood the requirements of the Air Force. Okay. Uh, so they, under, they understood the requirements. They all, they had what they called goal congruency. All the members of this team knew what they were trying to achieve. They were trying to achieve the winning bid that satisfied the Air Force customer needs, okay? <coughs> that was what drove all their decisions. And they, so they understood what the cost, uh, the requirements were. Now what did they do? They got the designers and the, sub, the subcontractors were involved in the design. And this turned out that in the process, the subcontractors had to rearrange their expected work share. Some subcontractors gave up a portion and others gained. Okay, so actually, you know, if you think about it from a narrow point of view, you know, you're giving up some business so that you can gain some. But they knew that that was important to win the contract. Okay, and so they reallocated workshop. Specifically, they had some partitioned uh, electronics on separate boards, and they realized if they integrate those on the same board, they could greatly reduce the cost and uh, so on. And the result was where they originally thought this, this unit was gonna cost $68,000 per unit, in the end it cost $15,000 per unit. Okay, and, and Boeing now, McDonnell Douglas was bought by Boeing. Boeing is making these things, that's the plant in East St. Louis, and everybody's happy. Boeing's making lots of money, the Air Force is getting lots of supplies, but you know, look how much cost reduction they had by getting those designers involved in the development, uh, sub subcontractors involved in the development and design. Okay, then the fourth attribute is the seamless flow of information. And this is a busy picture, which we don't want to read all, but the point is that we got here the system integrator, the aspect medical, and we have over here the supplier. And in a non-lean supply chain, what would happen is uh, over here in engineering uh, of the supplier, they may have a question. They would go up to their sales department. They would come over here to procurement would come down here to get answered, okay? Lots of vertical communication paths, okay? What you want in a lean supply chain is a lot of horizontal communication paths. You, and you need it to align it with the level of the organization. So you would like engineers talking with engineers. Now, sometimes when we give this talk in a <coughs> government procurement audience, they say, oh, that's illegal. You can't do that. It may be, but that means it's also not lean, <laughs> okay, okay, okay? You know, those things can be changed, okay? But you have to have some clear guidelines about what's communicated, who has responsibility to communicate. But you want these people on the phone and on email contact sharing information to have a flexible, responsive supplier. Okay, so we've got a lot of information flow, common databases. Uh, you want to be accessing the same database. You want to have members on the same integrated product team. We'll talk about that tomorrow. You want to be exchanging technical data at this level, not going up and down, uh, and, and some other things here which we won't go into. But clearly that's a different way of doing business, okay, uh, from, a, from an environment where you have a non-lean supply chain. Okay, another example of smooth information flow is Exostar. Exostar is a company 
an organization which manages the interactions between major aerospace companies and their suppliers. So it's like a hub in the supply chain. They have 34,000 uh, participants in this system, okay? And it's, it's all electronic, so suppose Boeing wants to buy some kind of, say, actuators, okay? Instead of going to all the actuator companies, they go through Exostar, who manages that transaction. And it's all very uh, paperless. Uh, uh, and um, it's just been a huge savings. And here are some results from Rolls-Royce, which is one of the members. Uh, some, of the, some of the metrics that go with their participation in Exostar, okay, they have, instead of having several, several thousand suppliers, they deal with several hundred. Uh, reduction of cost of goods purchased of up to 20% because of this integrated su supplier uh, management system. Inventory levels down 80%, error reduction down because they're not manually entering in a lot of data. Reduced cycle times as much as 80%, basically elimination of paper and improved relations who've benefited from this uh, uh, reduced transaction cost. Okay, so now let's move to the last topic of the, of the module and that is how do you improve existing supply chains? Well, we already heard from Jeff yesterday, you work with your suppliers, okay? Uh, you know, you look at your value stream, you try to find out what are you, who are your critical suppliers, you want to work with them, uh, so who's on the critical path, you know, where are the high <coughs> cost items or the long lead items and so on, and, and, and Jeff just couldn't have said it better yesterday, he said when they started their lean transformation, they went out and let their suppliers know that they weren't dropping them, they were just going to deal with them differently, okay? If, they're, if the supplier is, um, um, ready to become a lean, a lean organization. Now they may not be ready yet. They may not have the right management or they may not be educated. They might not have taken a lean academy and learned the importance of this, okay? Then they gotta do some, some prep work, but if they're lean ready, then they can go out and the prime will actually work with the supplier. Uh, they'll go out and they'll run Kaizen events with them. They might lend them a lean expert to be on site for a while. They might invite them to their training programs. We taught one of these lean academies at at Raytheon up the road, uh, not Raytheon, Textron Systems up the road here in Wilmington, Delaware. A couple of years ago, Hugh and I and Jackie taught that. And uh, they invited their suppliers to the class. Okay, they had about five suppliers, some from California, some from Colorado. Okay, they build the relationship. They understand what the value stream uh, mapping, that value stream is. They, they come up with their plans to develop a lean strategy in that, in that uh, organization and they have some mutual workshops and Kaizen events and a kind of a continuous improvement cycle. So this is, this is the way a lean organization works with its suppliers. It helps them, it invests in them. Um, actually, we have some people here from the Veterans Administration, Rockwell Collins, which we already talked about in this uh, Lean Academy, started to see that some of their major costs were their health care for their employees in the Cedar Rapids area. So they started working with the Cedar Rapids hospitals to help them become lean because they knew in the long term it was gonna benefit them. And they loan their lean experts to Mercy Hospital in, in Cedar Rapids and they're doing great things now, okay? Okay, here's one example from Boeing about uh, Hicksville Machine Works on Long Island and some of the benefits that, that came out. And, and these, these benefits that Hicksville re came from Boeing, they're gonna use with other customers, okay? Boeing invested in it and they'll use other customers. That's okay because everybody's gonna win. So those are kind of typical type things. Now as you do this, you, you're, you start treating your supply base more strategically, okay? Instead of a supply base being all the same, uh, you're strategic. So certain ones you have strategic alliances with, these might be really critical um, partners. Um, for instance, Rockwell Collins is a, has a strategic alliance with Boeing because they build flight decks. Uh, your suppliers, you'll certify them uh, so that, say, a gold supplier, you know, is very reliable. You might not do any inspection on something that comes in from a gold supplier. It just goes directly online because you know that they have their processes under control and that they've inspected it before it left and taken the quality responsibility. Where uh, someone who's on probation might be just the opposite. You're not having good performance from them, so you have a lot of quality control of them. You might have your people out in there you know, they might be having troubles with their production system, and so you're sending help out there to help them. 
Okay, strategically support, important suppliers might be have, say, some particular kind of materials, uh, some titanium or something, that maybe there's only one supply for. So that's a, that, that one you want to treat strategically. These are sort of the commodity items, a core, uh, that you have, and then these are the ones you're getting rid of. They're just not performing. So supply chain management is a core competency of a lean organization. Okay, where are we going in the future? The old approach is the, the build to order. The customer sends an order to the prime, the prime sends it back to the customer, the prime puts it down to the subcontractor, the subcontract. So a lot of interfaces, rigid interfaces, lack of communication, distrustful relationships. You know, you beat up, the prime beats up on their supplier, you're caught, get your costs down, you know, that type of thing. Current lean is much more collaborative um, with sharing a lot of information. So you might invite your suppliers in and give them your sales forecast, your business plans. Uh, that's, that's very proprietary information for most companies. Okay, but if it's an important supplier, you want them to know what the visibility is. Emerging lean is like with the JDAM, where you actually form almost like a company for that project, and you open up your proprietary databases for design and, and development. Uh, and there's some examples uh, in our book about that. Okay, so wrap up. Suppliers are critical to a lean enterprise success. Uh, supply chains need to be understood and designed to meet the needs of the product. Okay, legacy supply chains can be improved through win-win customer supplier teamwork. And it's a core competency of a lean organization.